few bands have experienced such extreme highs and lows as the Bee Gees. Throughout their decades-long career, the band of brothers managed to be both grossly underrated and also one of the best-selling live acts of all time. Barry Gibb and his younger twin brothers, Maurice and Robin, started out in the late 50s as a teenaged pop group in Australia. Their impeccable three-part harmony caught the ear of the prominent UK manager Robert Stigwood, who had a heavy hand in molding the Bee Gees into a world-renowned group. By 1969, though, the band imploded due to power struggles and battles with addiction. A year and a half later, the Bee Gees were back together. And after a few fits and starts in 1976, Barry Gibb discovered his famed falsetto. Their classic run of disco hits followed including the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack, which was the highest-selling soundtrack of all time until The Bodyguard in 1992. On today's episode, Rick Rubin talks to Barry Gibb about his new Dave Cobb-produced album, which features country music-inspired renditions of the Gibbs Brothers' brilliant songbook with guest features on every track. They also talk through the making of some of Rick's favorite Bee Gees songs, and Barry recalls what it was like producing Barbra Streisand who wouldn't sing a single note before 2 a.m. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Rick Rubin with Barry Gibb. I have a question about songwriting. Yeah. Historically, do you write songs with a purpose in mind or do songs just come all the time? Are you always writing, in other words? Well, they come more often than not in the middle of the night, you know. So if there's an idea uh, or a chorus, you know what the chorus is. You know what the message of the song. I think that's the key is knowing what the song is about and then working backwards, you know. So you've got the chorus. And what I've always done is, okay, make sure you got the chorus recorded because I have a little thing next to my bed. Great. And if I, if I love it, I'll record it. And tomorrow it may be nonsense, but I, I got to record it anyway. Is it both mo- melody and lyrics, or is it just melody? No, no, it's 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 all of the above. You you've got to know where you're going. You've got to know. You've got to work in. Uh, I like to work in levels because Roy Orbison is is my freak. I just love him, and all of his songs build all the time. And that was the greatest lesson for me. Songwriting is to keep keep rising, keep rising, reach reach some kind of climax. And to me, that's a great song. You know, and that's why I love Nashville, because people are still writing great songs. And I really don't get too much of that anywhere else. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you heard Roy Orbison? Yes. Uh, the first record I ever bought was Crying. And wow. It just destroyed me. And it wasn't just the song in itself. It was the way he just kept s- slowing it down, taking the tempo, not the tempo, but the mood down and then bringing it up again. And so for me, that's the greatest songwriter, pop songwriter I've ever known, you know. So In Dreams, Blue Bayou, Jesus. (laughs) Unbelievable. And the voice. The voice is just otherworldly. It was otherworldly and very spiritual. And my father always said, yeah, but he's not in tune. And my my feeling was, that doesn't matter, Dad, you know. It doesn't have to be Bing Crosby, you know. It just has to move you. And, And Roy Orbison moved me beyond anything I've ever known. Was, was your dad a musician as well? I mean, he was a drummer. Yeah, so I got, huh. a, yeah. <laughs> so I got a lot of my rhythmic senses from my father, you know? So I was always, you know, I was always doing something rhythmic. I even had paint cans in the garden upside down so I could play them. And I didn't, I don't know if the neighbors ever con- were concerned about it, but it was noisy. But that's, you know, that was my father's influence on me. There's an interesting history of great singers who come from a more rhythmic background, you know, drumming, like yeah. Steven Tyler, for example, was a drummer. And yeah. it, it's often the case. It's, uh, it definitely adds something. Yeah, it's, it's something that's deep inside you. And at some point, somebody says something about that and you rise to it, you know. So the discovery of the falsetto and, and the nonsense that came from all of that was so much rhythm involved, you know. And we had to kick it up. We were told to kick it up or we were gone. You know? So, <laughs> you know, I love them all. I love, <laughs> I, love, I love record companies that tell you they're going to drop you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. It's, a, it's amazing that uh, 
you've had the most roller coaster ride maybe of yeah. any artist I could think of in terms of how high the highs were. It's it's right. really unusual. And I was thinking about it earlier and the Bee Gees are one of the most successful groups in the history of recorded music. Yeah. It's not arguable. It's, you know, top three, top, you know, right, right up there. It might have been arguable in the past, but I think people, some of our people who have always followed us have, have come back around and some of those songs really mean something now. And I don't understand that, but that's okay. But what's interesting about it is to be as successful as that and still be underrated. There is no explanation for it. You know, I think you can have, maybe you can have too much success. Maybe that's got something to do with it. And you can be overexposed and not know it. And I think that's happened to other artists apart from us. And we didn't really embrace that. You know, we were raising children and life changed. And yeah, we were a little pissed off, if that's the right term. But, um, you know, it didn't change us. It didn't change us from who we were. And really, it wasn't me. It was the, it was the three of us. And the three of us were determined. And yes. that's how it worked. And it's more than a pop group. It's a family. You know, so pop groups break up. Families don't really break up, you know? Yes, that's, an, that's another part of it that's interesting is that, yes, we've seen other artists reach ho tremendous highs and then have a backlash, but then they very rarely survive and they very rarely come back to reach even higher peaks. It, almost none. That's it's true. Unbel it's really an unbelievable trajectory and um, I'm just so happy that you did it. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what happened. <laughs> you know, I think the connection with Dave Cobb and, and my love of, of uh, Nashville music and bluegrass music, my God. I still love the Dixie Chicks. I don't, I don't know what happened, yeah. but I love them. And, and I love the record you made with them. And I don't understand any of that crap because that's freedom of speech, you know? <laughs> Tell me about, uh, besides Roy, were there other, the earliest musical influences you can remember? The first thing that hit me hard was Teenage Queen with Johnny Cash. And his, his own legacy really affected me in a lot of different ways. He was like the voice of America, you know. And at that point, and the real story, the real story about all of that is it all stems from people like Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby. And there was no rock and roll. There was no pop music. It was something that they led us all into in their time. You know, but once Mr. Orbison, the big O, once he, once he arrived, that was it. Changed me forever. It's interesting how, how much of a role country music played in your life when it didn't make such, I mean, there were songs along the way that gave a clue, but it was yeah. never a, a feature in the Bee Gees. No, I know. I know. Because someone else was always telling us what we should be recording. There was always somebody telling us what direction we should be going in. And I don't think we ever became independent in that, in that respect. In life now you can be, but in those days you really couldn't. There was a stage where the guy from the record company would, would be sitting in the soundproof room making notes on what we were recording. And that was a pure aggravation. You know, you just you just can't make records like that. And and I, I heard that I've heard other people say that, you know, how can you be how can you be creatively independent if someone's telling you what's wrong and what's right about what you're doing? So mm. that's part of it. Were the Everly Brothers ever an influence? Oh, come on. <laughs> the Everly Brothers, most powerful influence in our lives. Them and Roy Orbison. But I met Phil Everly a few years back at BMI, and I nearly fainted, you know. And, <laughs> and the thing was, he was standing with Dwayne Eddy. And, and, and I, I went and grabbed Stephen, and I said, Dwayne Eddy and Phil Everly are in the other room standing together. Come on, I said, let's go take a picture as fast as we can, you know. So I have this picture of Phil Everly and Dwayne Eddy in my, in my study and an unforgettable moment. How great is it to be a music fan? Isn't it oh, great? It's wonderful. And, and you don't always have to be about yourself, you know? You can love a lot of other things, a lot of other artists, and it's okay. What would have been the first place that you guys heard three-part harmony as opposed to Everly's two-part harmony? Well, that, the, the, the two-part thing came from Robin really not wanting to sing socially. He, he would never sit in the lounge and sing with Morris and me. It was just something that he, he just wasn't comfortable doing. But Morris and I, under those circumstances, became the Everly Brothers. And, and we would sing all of those songs. And my favorite is still Let It Be Me and Devoted to You. And you, you could not help it. 
If you couldn't be exactly like them, you could try. Do you remember the first influence of hearing three-part harmony? Mills Brothers. Mills Brothers. Mills Brothers, yeah. And uh, it was our father who was, who was a real Mills Brothers fan, and he would bring these records home, and, and, uh, and we got to know songs like Till Then and Up a Lazy River and, and these amazing harmonies, and then they would impersonate instruments and, and do things like that. And the father was always on guitar at the back, and it was a family. Beautiful. The vocals were remarkable for that time. So I was in love. And eventually I, I met Donald Mills, who was, the, who was the, the very soft vocalist. And Harry, his brother, was the rock and roller, you know. <laughs> Tell me about um, Robert Stigwood. I never got to meet him. Well, you're better off. <laughs> 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 um, Robert was a little bit... Um, he was a little bit of a, a dictator, you know. He was a very, very much believed in what he was saying. He was very aristocratic. I've seen Robert throw absolute tantrums uh, just to get his own way. So, wow. oh yeah, he was he was an angry man, but he was creatively on fire. And so I think that maybe was the, one of the last great managers that we've ever seen, anyway. And it did it did seem like he was really on your side and really fought for you. Well, I think Robert was on the side of great business, you know? Understood. That's the deal. That's how it is. And you're better off just looking the other way and, and getting on with what you do. But he was a businessman down to the core, and we were lucky and fortunate to be signed to NEMS because that was the Beatles company. And, and so it all rubbed off on us in some way. But I remember the days when you could dress any way you felt like dressing. Flower power dictated everything. And... My favorite memory is being in the elevator at NEMS, going up to Brian Ep Epstein's offices with Eric Clapton, who was dressed as a cowboy. <laughs> and I was dressed as a priest. So <laughs> figure that out, you know. It's like we both looked at each other and maybe we both sensed something crazy about all of this, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Was there something about growing up in Australia that you think had an effect? Profoundly. I don't know if you're aware of all these people, but Johnny O'Keefe, Col Joy, and eventually Billy Thorpe dominated Australian radio and dominated Australian pop. And it was Col Joy and his brother Kevin Jacobson that got us our first record contract. So wow. the link is powerful, you know, and the influences were powerful. And I could, I could name a dozen artists that influenced us in Australia, but you can't, you're better off being influenced and not, and not really dealing with all of it. But I love Cole, and I love all. I love his family. We actually stayed with his family, and this was the biggest pop star in Australia. You know, it's their own world. It's their own world, and they don't take much notice of anything else. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, when we finish, if you could make a list of the songs from then, yeah. because we could uh, share a playlist of Australian music that most of the people listening have never heard. And it, yeah, no, I, I love. I love it when we get to hear new music. You know. Yeah, I. I it will be a pleasure to do that. And I can already think of half a dozen songs that, uh, that you might hear and go, oh, wow, that's actually really good, but no one ever heard of it outside of Australia. Great. What were your first impressions when you went to London? We were just delighted to be able to get into the race. You know, we, we wanted to be, we just wanted to be famous. You know, it sounds really silly, but that's what we wanted, you know. And whatever we needed to do creatively to become famous, we were ready and I, that's not true. We were very naive. But, <laughs> but at the same time, we were, we were ready to learn. We were ready to learn and grow. And so we arrived in London, a thrill of our lifetime. Personally, I would have been just as happy to stay in Australia. I really would. Mm -hmm. The most incredible country. And we were growing up there, and I was still growing up there when we left. So I, I miss that. When you went back to Australia with the Bee Gees, how was the welcome well, it was always great. I mean, you know, sometimes you sold out and sometimes you didn't. But that was early days, about 1971, 72. And eventually, over time, uh, after Fever, we did the new Olympic Stadium. Wow. And that was the thrill of a lifetime because this was where we came from in a way. Amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. Great days. So there's a beautiful song about um, To Love Somebody that you wrote it for Otis Redding. Yes, sir. After he passed and you had the song, was there any question whether or not you should record it for yourself? 
Well, only because we lost Otis Redding, you yeah. know, and I we wouldn't have touched it because it wasn't written for us. It was written for Otis Redding. And the only reason we actually came around, oh, let's just record it ourselves, you know. Um, I, I miss the fact that he, he would have blown it away, you know. And we all loved yeah. Otis Redding. So that's another, that's another incredible influence. You know? it's, it's such an interesting thing because the, the song is such a quintessential BG song. Oh, the idea that you might not have sung it is a radical idea. <laughs> right. But you can hear me trying to sound like Otis Redding. Yeah. You know, you can sort of hear that influence, you know. Yeah, only after hearing the story, though. Ne I right, never okay. heard it until hearing the story. Okay. I always heard that. <laughs> and <laughs> and we loved Otis Redding. And and Robin particularly loved Otis Redding. And, and he had that kind of voice where he could deliver that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Robin was unique. The problem for Rob was he didn't believe in it enough. He didn't believe in his own voice enough. And so over the years... He tried to sound differently than he, he really should have sounded. Because if he'd been honest to him, if he'd been him, I think he would have seen a lot of mileage, a lot of mileage. But he didn't, he didn't believe in it enough. Yeah. Wow, he's got one of the most beautiful voices in right. the history of recorded music. It's unbelievable. No argument from me. <laughs> Did you guys get involved in the orchestration? And oh, I always did the, um, the strings with Bill Shepard, who, who first worked with us in Australia. And when we came back, I did, I did things like Massachusetts with Bill. Wow. I did a lot of uh, different orchestrations because Robin loved it, but he, he, do, he really didn't want to be bothered with that. Understood. So that's, uh, I did some of that stuff. But Bill, you know, he was, he, he, you couldn't control what Bill was going to do until the day of the, or the, day of the session. Do you remember any of the other R&B singers that might have influenced some of the singing? Marvin Gaye, no question. A lot of the other people that, that were making records in those days, because once, once I met Armand Ertigan in New York, he, he took me along with Robert to the Apollo. And I saw for the first time in my life a full black show. And Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye and um, Otis Redding blew my socks off, you know. So, and I was sitting right in the middle of the theater. So it couldn't have been more powerful to me than it was. And, and I know that Robin, Robin would have loved it. Do you think Ahmed brought you with the idea of potential for writing in that style? Or did he just bring you because he thought you'd enjoy the show? Uh, he did come to Miami when we were recording Nights on Broadway. And we, we, our title was Lights on Broadway. And he said, no, <laughs> you can't call it Lights on Broadway. He said, but you can call it Nights on Broadway because it's more sensual it just has more meaning to it so he was good he was good at saying things like that to us and he was a great man so he would come into town even if he didn't need to he was he was very dedicated to his artists and but he's the guy who said if through robert if they don't kick it up we're, and we're going to drop them wow so that's that's the record industry you know yeah. and it, it's it, it can be really angry it can be really ruthless if you're not doing what they want you to do do you remember the first time you met Ahmed? Uh, my visit to New York to meet the Nempra people, to meet Nat Weiss and, and uh, Ahmed and Nasui, his brother. Yeah, I do. Uh, and we went to his apartment and Robert insisted on playing Bee Gees first. And I think it was all about making, making Ahmed happy to sign us up and, and represent us at Atlantic Records. And that's how it worked. That's, that's what happened. But we were never in the light. We never, we never saw these things happening. They just happened. Yeah. Tell me about Arif. Arif was wonderful. Uh, he was like our uncle, you know. But, but he always played that role. He, he was a genius. And he started out with us on an album called Mr. Natural. And it didn't pan out. It wasn't successful. But bless his heart, he said, well, let's do another. You know, let's do one more. And, and, and of course, he was the in-house producer for Atlantic Records. And main course was the album and Jive Talking and all this stuff. That was the album that we first really worked with Ahmed. Well, we'd worked with him before, but this was different. And I think he was taking his instructions from Ahmed. And, and uh, at the end of main course, if I, I could be wrong, I don't think I am, but I think that uh, Saturday Night Fever featured Jive Talking, but not the record, the live version. And I think that that was maybe underhanded. 
And I think that Ahmed was really upset about it. And so was Arif. So that caused a lot of friction between Robert and Atlantic and Ahmed. We never saw it, but we knew it, you know. And suddenly Ahmed canceled Arif being our producer. So, you know, if you want to get back at, at a manager, hit the artist, you know. And, and that was the way that the business worked then. That was the way. But we never saw it. We, never, we didn't know what anybody was unhappy about until, until we figured out what had happened, that Robert was trying to avoid paying Atlantic royalties on the record. Understood. And they used the live version, which made everybody really angry. Yeah. Also interesting that um, it led to some of your most successful work, yeah. even without Arif. And, that, and that's interesting, too, because ha, you, know, you can't tell like what seems like a bad thing in the moment leads to something different and it turns out great it's like we don't know we can't predict we don't know you don't know what's going to happen with any record you make and we didn't know we just we were asked to write a certain amount of songs for this film we never saw the script and <laughs> we just we had to reinvent ourselves because of what armored said and the the falsetto was discovered basically on nights on broadway so didn't even know it existed that's very strange but that's how it was. What was your first introduction to disco music as disco music? Well, we, we didn't know what disco music was. I'm just telling yeah. you the, exactly how we felt about it all. We didn't know. Uh, the word disco never entered our heads until afterwards. I actually agree with you that you should be dancing and night fever with disco records. There's no question about that. But they were party records to us. They were records that were made in fun. You know, and, and, and we had to run away a little bit from the big pathos ballads because the record company didn't want us to do that anymore. And that must have affected Rob, affected all of us. But the discovery of this other voice uh, was, in, in a way, a, an incredible thing because that's all everybody wanted after that, including Rob, because Rob's, Rob, Rob's obsession was hit records. Hit records. He said, you know, I don't have to sing them but they, I want a hit, I want another hit. And so he would always say along with other people, go and do that voice again, go do that voice again. So I think we were all victims with the same thing. Um, we loved it, we loved the adventure of it. We loved coming up with things that people hadn't heard before. We loved the embellishment, the multi-tracks. The new game was Slaves and Masters, you know? And you know, you can have a tape full of glee guitar and you bounce what you like onto the master. That, would be, that had become the new norm at that point. So I think we got trapped or cornered into the adventure, you know, and we, we, we never knew what was going to happen. And at, one, at some point, we were selling a million records a week, but it was a double album and it was a compilation album. So you could never really say, oh, that's us, you know. It ne never really affected us that way. We couldn't believe what was happening because we were trying to make this movie called Sergeant Pepper with Peter Frampton. And suddenly the dancers in the film were dancing to Saturday Night Fever in, in the lunch break. I thought, what are they doing? You know? And we all had, you probably heard it before, we all had one Winnebago and Peter Frampton had his own Winnebago. And after about two weeks, we each had a Winnebago. <laughs> so that was the only reflection of success that we understood at that point. It's interesting that you've, you, in some ways, the Bee Gees have come to define disco when it was never really what you, it's never really what you did. And you, and no. it's, it's also interesting that, that people who were making disco records while they were dance records tended not to be song-based records. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Um, I, I, we didn't know what we were doing or where we were going, but we were loving the adventure of it. We were loving doing something different. And I think the whole concept of reinventing yourself came to, came to us. Um, every Beatles album had a different color cover. They looked different every time. They, they, didn't, they didn't think of music as something you heard. They, they thought of music as something you saw. And that was my lesson, that, that a song has to be visual. You know, you have to know, you have to be there to, to, to love a song. And that's where Roy Orbison touched me. That's where the Beatles touched me. Eleanor Rigby is probably one of my favorite records of all time. Not just because it's a great record, but because there was a vision. There was a, there was a storyline. There was people in the story. And I loved all of that. And 
We may have even tried to imitate that, but they, they, were, they were the only people who could do that. Tell me about uh, Criteria, the studio. Criteria, well, we, we spent about five or six years between Main Course and Fever and then and, uh, Children of the World before Fever. And You Should Be Dancing and songs like that ended up in, in the movie. So it wasn't like Fever was directly written for the movie. There were songs taken from Like You Should Be Dancing was taken from Children of the World. So I think, yes, we were very influenced by whatever disco was, but we didn't understand, we didn't know about the word. It was only when disco became bad, a bad word. <laughs> yeah. About a year later, maybe two years later, it became a bad, a bad word. And we just had to swallow hard and keep going and keep trying. And it was always, for us, it was always, well, back to the studio, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Were the Eagles recording at the same time as you were recording? They did one of these nights, a criteria, and that really triggered a lot of things for us because they were using falsetto as well. So it didn't feel like a sin. It didn't feel like we shouldn't something we shouldn't do. And they didn't do it much after that. So it was just one of these nights, and Hotel California was a totally different type of record. Do you think they were influenced by you guys in the making of that song? No, I think it was the other way around. Really? <laughs> yeah. We thought, well, if they can do that, we were already doing that, so we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be concerned about it. We should just make music. So while the, um, the breakups of the group are famous, right. the reality is you're only apart very little time-wise, really, yeah. over the years. Like for, for 95%, 98% of the time that you were a band. What's but look at, look at how life was in those days. Um, there were all kinds of substances. There were all kinds of ways of getting high. We never could get hold of anything the Beatles were taking, but, but <laughs> that's become a truth. So, you know, but we certainly had our fun. You know, we had amphetamines and we had, uh, I think Morris was, he loved to drink. Robin and I both loved amphetamines and I in particular love grass. So these things come and go and, I, you, you know, you grow. But I certainly remember that that was a source of inspiration. Mm. But interesting that, that the breakup, the, the time that you were apart was ended up being short in the big picture. Yeah, about 15 months, 15 or 16 months. And, and I would say that's what it was down to. Yeah. That's what it was down to. Those substances and the an inability to understand each other. And uh, that there isn't one of us that's responsible for that. It was all of us. And then you had management, which was pretty crazy anyway, you know. And that's, that's just what happened. You can't, you, as you said, you don't know. You just don't know what's going to happen. In splitting up lead vocal parts, yeah. would it always be obvious who would sing what? Or was the person who wrote a part the person who sang it? Yes, always. The person who came in with the idea would be the person who sang the song. And that's because that person had already made a commitment to singing that song emotionally. So you didn't take a song from, away from each other, no. If Robin came in with a song like Holiday or like Saved by the Bell, which he eventually did as a solo artist, but he did, he did do it with Mo. So it wasn't really, it was twins, you know, and that's how you had to deal with it. Well, I was going to ask, did, often was the case that you guys sung together as well? Oh, Run To Me. We had been apart. We'd been apart for about sixteen months, fifteen or sixteen months, and suddenly Robin. We were living in Kensington, and Robin turned up at my front door, and we 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 just got on immediately. And we he sat down in 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 the kitchen with me, and I said to him, hey, "I'm working on this song at the moment. Do you want to do it with me?" And he went, "Yeah, of course." And that was how can you mend a broken heart? And wow. And I said to him at that point, "Why don't you sing the first verse?" because I was trying to reach out. I was trying to say, you know what? I don't want to sing this whole song. We're writing it together. Let's sing it together. That's how that one came about. So Robin sang the first verse. I sang the second verse. And it proved to be something that was just interesting because it was, it was varied. It wasn't the same person all the time. So, but the message was strong. And really, it was a personal message about the three of us. Yeah, it's one of the secrets of the Beatles as well. The fact that there were multiple voices yeah. allowed it if you hear one person sing 12 songs in a row, it, it has one effect. <laughs> Whereas if people take turns, even if you don't always know who's singing, there's something in you that feels like something new is happening all the time, and it's exciting. Right. And that same thing applies to when you're not singing. That something has to take over. 
something, some instrumental form or some little riff or something or other that, that replaces the vocal for just 10 seconds or five seconds. And that worked really well for us. And we just learned and learned and grew from that. But that's how we came back together. Tell me about working with Barbara. Oh, incredible. Um, well, you know, you, you, can, you can imagine what Barbara's like. She's very strong, willed, and very intentional about what she's doing. But, but the issue was always for me is when she wanted to sing. And, of course, if you're dealing with Barbara, uh, um, you can't just say, okay, it's time to sing, Barbara. You know, it just never worked that way. So the last record we made, she would say, well, I, I don't like singing until 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to do that. I said, I'm only going to last two nights if you do that, you know? Oh, well, I like doing it that way. Okay, well, we still didn't. And, and so what was a two-week session became a three-week session because she didn't really feel like singing until she felt like singing. But that's wow. Barbara. She's unique and, and special, and there's a reason why everybody loves her, and, and I'm one of them. I went to an event that was um, a friend's uh, passing. Right. And some of the greatest artists of all time sang at this event. And Barbara was the final person to sing. And this was after all of the people who we consider the greatest singers of all time. And I had, I had not known much about Barbara at that time. I mean, my mom loved Barbara, but yeah. I didn't know much about her. And from the moment she opened her voice, before the, bef from the first phrase she was the only person who existed it was like from another planet it's it's magical but when she decided to commit to it it was amazing when we first did guilty she sang it once and 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 i said well can you give us like five takes so that we can you know choose and pick and all that stuff and she said well i just sang it <laughs> i thought <laughs> I know you did, Barbara. It's wonderful, but we need five takes because, I don't know, we want to amplify what you're doing. We want to make it more, more passionate. And so she went out and sang it five more times, but she didn't understand that until wow. I said, can you do it more than once? She said, well, I just did it. <laughs> I'm, amazed. I'm amazed that you got her to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, we had Walter Yetnikoff sitting in the soundproof room and Charles Copperman, so I think that... Uh, you know, her clo the closest people to her understood what we were doing. And, yeah. and the only time she ever said anything about guilty was, was when she didn't like the word battle. Battle on, in that particular sentence. So we had to go find another battle. <laughs> mm. And we did. <sighs> Tell me about the writing of Woman in Love. We were in a few houses down the road, the three of us, and we were in a spare bedroom. And we just found out that Barbara wanted to do that album. And uh, I was to come up with five songs and I was to go to LA and play them to her. And that was basically how it came about. That was the first thing we wrote actually was Guilty. Wow. And, and then Woman in Love. Yeah. And then we took them to LA and she, we, she sat on a big pillow and everyone sat around and listened to the first five songs. And at the end, she said, okay. She said, okay, let's do it. She said, can you give me another five? <laughs> How am I going to do that? And she just said, well, just give me another five, you know. But that's Barbara. And you went ahead and did it. So, so it was written specifically for her to sing. Oh, yeah. If, if, if you weren't tasked with writing something for Barbara, that song might not have ever come. It, well, it wouldn't have happened if, if it hadn't been for the falsetto. Because what was what was what worked great for me was that I could always do something in a woman's key, and so if you're writing for a woman and you happen to sing it in her key, it's much more attractive to the person who you want to sing the song, you know. So I was lucky in that respect. So, but you don't want to hear me sing "Woman in Love," <laughs> you know. I think I'd rather hear Barbara do it. Usually, I think of your falsetto as as sort of a. A, a loud it's essentially a rock falsetto <laughs> but okay. this was very yeah. tender ballad yeah i mean I, I was experimenting all over the place so so you good. know you could we could go from you should be dancing to love so right and they're all different they're all different love so right was our r&b passion did you ever get to meet the people from tk disco because i know you're in florida in miami 
And it's like, oh, no, no. I got to know uh, um, Casey and the Sunshine Band. And we've we bumped into each other over the years. And a uh, really nice guy. Yeah. And I love those records. And they Me were too. party records, you know. They were made for fun. and, and Great music. Astounding. But the same with Nile Rodgers. I mean, that was... That was same era, you know, and they, they just wanted to have, they wanted to make people dance. They wanted to make people, they wanted accuracy. And so our mission became, how do we make the drums exact? How do we get that accuracy and, and get a groove? And that's how we came up with um, the two track tape that was just a downbeat and a backbeat. And it just repeated itself over and over again. And we were able to vary the speed. So woman in love, more than a woman, staying alive, is the same bass drum and backbeat. And wow. what we would do is we would just change the tempo and put the fills in after the fact because that gave us accuracy. And then the Roger Lynn drum machine came along. We never thought that was as good. Yeah. But I know we've used it a couple of times, but I'm over all that. I, I really love people playing. I love to hear people playing now. I'm not interested in programming at all. Interesting, though, that that was really before there was such a thing as sampling, you yeah. guys were doing it. Well, Before we were experimenting, and, and once we realized that, 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 that making a record that was fun or, or fun to dance to or just, just fun in itself, um, we needed to create a way to, to, to have accurate drums or a drum groove. Dennis always did a fantastic job of doing the turns on top of that, but that's, that was our basis of it. Do you remember the first time you saw Saturday Night Fever with all the music in it? Yeah, at the Chinese theater standing at the back of the audience with John Travolta. And, wow. and as, if I remember it well, I remember the two of us not really enjoying the fact that you could hear people, you could hear the people's feet dancing louder than the music. Wow. And so we went up to Stiggy and said, you know, the music should be the loudest thing you hear. You never hear people dancing in a club. The music's always the dominant factor, you know? Turn up the music and turn down the feet. So that's what they did. Great. And I think that was something that John and I both felt really strongly about. You can't, you can't dance to something you can hardly hear. What was the audience reaction to that first uh, screening? I, as far as I could tell, you know, they, they all loved it. Uh, John and I loved it. And that was our only critique, if you like. And, and, and that led to things like Greece. And, you know, so between, between 75 and maybe 81, starting with maybe main course and ending with grease or emotion and things like that. So it was just one record after another. And we became a little tainted because everything we were doing was going to number one and we just couldn't focus. And these records as well, you know, yeah. we were dealing with that as well at the same time. So they were incredible records as well. Incredible. Yeah. But you know, we were, we were also pretty dazed. So about six years in, we were having this, this incredible success. But, but we were getting dazed. We were getting dazed and confused. And Albie wanted to, I want to salute Albie, Albie and Carl because they were fantastic co-producers, in my opinion. We were a team. But that wore itself out too. So Carl wanted to, didn't want to have to travel to the studio every day and wanted to have a happy life with Candy. And Albie wanted to go to California because he loved windsurfing. And, and they had their own personal things in life that were becoming more interesting for them. And that's just how it worked out. You know, it was a six-year span of incredible records, in my opinion. But everything has an ending to it. By the way, congratulations on the documentary, which is spectacular. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I've never heard a negative word about it, except from one person, and I won't even mention his name. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's magnificent. It's interesting to see that that period is following a, a real fall. Oh, absolutely. The rise and fall and rise are shocking. Absolutely. And it, it, it also, what it negated for you, it, was, it, it, it negated the idea of having an ego. Because every time you had success, your head would blow up and then something bad would happen and you just came down to earth again, you know? So everything I do, I often say to my son, Stevie, I'm just waiting to get dropped on my head again, you know? Because, because that's the nature of what we do, you know? And, and something really works or something really doesn't. And that time period, what everyone calls the backlash, I don't like the word, but there you go. You know, uh, it, once again, I really believe more than anything else that we were overexposed. And I've seen it with other artists. Yes. Uh, I've seen it with Michael. And I got to know Michael pretty well. But 
he began to become dazed. He became dazed by all of it. And, and you can have too much success. You know, it affects your head. Yeah, well, it's, it's like a lack of reality it, because it, yeah. it's so unnatural. Yeah, well, you know, you're throwing the dice every time you go in the studio and, and you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, I think about Elvis and I think about the Beatles and, and I think about that period, that end period where things just fragmented, you know, for any kind of reason. And the choosing of material also became an element where the artist wasn't choosing, wasn't doing the right songs anymore. They were just trying to do something that wasn't quite working the same way. And I think that that's what happened to Michael. And I think that's what happened to Elvis. And I think that's probably what happened to us. And we had to come back around and, and kick ourselves in the backside and get back in the studio and do something, do something exciting again, you know? Have you ever been surprised in either direction with either a song that you thought this is the best song we've ever wrote and it, and it doesn't work or a song that you don't think much about that really takes off? Oh, well, my favorite song is Immortality uh, that Celine did. So I, I, can't, I can't critique that because the fact that she recorded it was an enormous compliment, you know. So, but that's my favorite song because it reflects how we feel about our lives no matter what. So this is who I am. This is all I know. You know, that's my favorite lyric. Wow. The whole song is my favorite. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's coming to a conclusion about yourself. Beautiful. So let's talk about the new album. How did it come about? Well, um, it's, a, it's a fantasy that, that, that's gone on for a couple of years for me. Not knowing about a pandemic, you know, the, it, was, it was a fantasy. And then one day, my eldest son, Stephen, came to me and played me a Chris Stapleton song. And I went, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, that's, that's people actually playing. People, have someone actually singing, you know. So that became our dream. He made a point of going to Nashville, meeting with different people. Jay Landers came on board and helped us put the, Great. Put the artists together. And everyone, nobody said no. A couple of people. <laughs> Chris being one of them. But <laughs> <laughs> he was the inspiration. So he, he's like in, involved in spirit. Yes, he is. And there's no question about that. But, you know, from Brandy Carlisle to Olivia Newton-John to Jason Isbell, J. Buchanan. Beautiful. All of these amazing artists. And, and Gillian Welch and Dave Rawlings. Come on. Incredible. And they didn't want to do a well-known song. So they chose Butterfly, which was something we wrote in 1966. So this, so this album was recorded all live in the studio, yeah. probably most like the very first recordings you ever made. Yep. Yeah, it was totally live, and there was no multi-tracking. But it really, this whole album made me fall back in love. Not that I was ever out of love, but I fell back into the idea that people just play, you know? Beautiful. Yeah. I'm so glad you get to have this experience now. Was, it, was there ever a, a choice to write new songs for it as opposed to using classic songs? There was only the idea of doing Words of a Fool with Jason. Mm -hmm. I played that to Dave and he listened to maybe six bars and he said, let's cut that. Great. <laughs> so, okay. Don't you want to hear the song? You know, he said, no, no. He said, I love, I love where it is. I love what you're doing. Let's do it. And those two songs, the, that one and Butterfly, were the only songs that I didn't think anyone had ever heard. And that was the, that was the target for me, is, is to feature a couple of songs that were really abstract and not very well known. And if we ever do another one, you know, um, maybe, maybe it's, it'll be time. And I would love to write with Jason and I would love to write with Jay because their voices are just amazing. And yes. singing with Gillian and Dave is sort of like singing with my brothers. I would love to hear that album. I would love the next album to be all original material written by you and the collaborators. That would be, that would be a beautiful thing to put in the world. I think that's the only way to go. I agree with you. I don't think we should try to do the same thing again in any way. Yeah. Great idea. I'll do that. <laughs> we want to hear it. We want to hear it. It's by popular demand. <laughs> that's why you're who you are. You know? <laughs> that's a great idea, and that's what we should do. Well, it's a pleasure seeing you again. Yes, sir. You wanted, you wanted Robin and I to make an album, but I knew that Robin wasn't well. But I mm. couldn't say that to you. Understood. You know? But I, I knew I that. Felt like, I just felt like there was potential for something that there was. I don't know. Again, I wanted to hear it. I wanted to yeah, hear it. Yeah, I know. I did too. But he was just too sick and he would never admit to that. You know? Yeah. 
And so, you know, we never really knew there was anything wrong with Rob until about six months before he passed. Mm. So that's just the way it was. Some people don't want to be ill. They don't want to, they don't want to tell anybody they're ill. Yes. So you get to, you get those two things, but that's what happened. Beautiful. Well, it's great seeing you and I hope to see you in person and can give you a hug as soon as we're allowed to do that. You too. I love you, my friend. And I'll see you soon. Thanks to Barry Gibb for sharing so much of his incredible story with Rick. To hear a playlist of Barry Gibb's favorite Australian songs from growing up, head to brokenrecordpodcast.com, where you'll also find a playlist we put together of our favorite Bee Gees cuts. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast, where you can find extended cuts of new and old episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez. With engineering help from Nick Chafee, our executive producer is Neil Lamar. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries, and if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace. <laughs>